good evening everyone today we are continuing on with our uh, well elongated chapter second uh, we discussed uh, in the last lecture uh, only the organizational structures and we could not continue further to do the network and voice quality and all that but anyways today i hope Uh, the connections are okay and we can uh, move on today we are uh, talking about uh, the organizational process assets enterprise environmental factors then we'll talk about the project governance project stakeholders project teams and all that so let us hope we we complete this chapter or somehow uh, gets to the get to the end of it uh, near near to end okay probably i described it earlier uh, what is organizational process assets and what are enterprise knowledge factors generally uh, you must remember that organizational process assets are all the assets of your organization related to processes so this terminology organizational process assets as such did not exist but pmi created it they started calling it organizational process assets and these are how processes in an organization can be organized so within an organization how do you organize your processes naturally through some documented rules regulations policies procedures and all that so generally all the organizational policies procedures rules regulations and uh, methods methodologies standards you follow uh then the different templates you use the formats you use for different form filling and all that uh plus uh, any historical data uh, any old lessons learned old files on uh, files and logs and registers all these things fall into the category of organizational process assets so essentially speaking they are documentary in nature almost all of these things which i mentioned they are documentary in nature so they are assets held by the organization and naturally if there is an asset you will be using it in your processes and therefore it is called organizational process assets so they include any or all process related assets from any or all of the organizations involved in the project because there could be more than one organization involved in the project but if there is only one organization then naturally all the organizational processes of that organization will apply that can be used to influence the project success naturally we are within the bounds of that organization and our success is influenced by whatever rules and regulations are invoked therefore these organizational processes are really very important to us uh, what are these these are the plans processes pol policies procedures knowledge bases specific to and used by the performing organization uh right they include any artifact practice or knowledge from any or all of the organizations involved in the project that can be used to perform or govern the project now what what do I, do all this mean these are all the things available for you from where you can seek your guidance some of those things might be mandatory some might not be mandatory some you know you may or may not like to uh, consult but all these things are available as a knowledge base maybe you know you have studied something from somewhere and that is a knowledge available with you maybe in form of a book or uh, in your mind whatever these things are assets but i am not at all saying that all the organizational process assets are mandatory some of them are mandatory some are not mandatory some are imposed on you through the organizational regulations others you may choose to pick and you may even form more organizational process assets uh, uh, in your organization so one thing is certain that these organizational process assets are all not mandatory but naturally they are available they are effective they can influence your project success so you have to pick and choose which asset is more useful for you uh, to be used in this specific project so project to project it may differ these might be practices and things which are uh, from all over the organization and some of these things may apply to your project some may not 
So you are the best judge, project manager and his team. They are the best judge to pick which processes to take and which not to uh, not to consider. Like PMB, okay, project management body of knowledge. What is it? Uh, somebody wants to use it, they can use it. Somebody doesn't want to use it, they may not use it. So this all depends upon your own good will, will and wish, whether you um, uh, acknowledge this knowledge base or not. So this, these are the standards. Now, does your organization adopt this standard? Do they follow this standard? Or at least, do they recognize this as a standard? Do they ever consult it? So if they do, you may use them. Otherwise, you may not. Similarly, does your organization have developed some project management methodologies? Naturally, this will only exist when your organization is in a serious business of doing projects. If they really have been repeatedly doing projects, they might have felt that they, they need to have some organizational methodology development developed for project management. Otherwise, a normal organization will never have any methods or methodologies available for project management. But anyways, the, if the, these uh, any methodologies or methods, models, these are available, they are assets for the project manager. He can always take advantage of them. Now, if you somehow want to link this organizational process as it is a huge tree lying in front of you and you can pick and choose out of it. Now, as I said, some of these items might be mandatory for you. How do they become mandatory? Let us see. Let us go slow and see. Uh, this is a big tree lying in front of you. Uh, nobody has mandated it that everything you must use. If this is a good organization, if it is a mature organization, they, as I said, they would have developed project management methodologies specific to your organization. They should have selected some models, some standards, put them together and specifically, you know, uh, put them into a system. That is called a project management system. How a project management should be done in your organization. Is there a simple, is there a method available, is there a system available? If there is a system available, the life of project manager and his team would be so easy that they would be doing just like, you know, you are following the SOPs. That would be project management would be so easy and good. But if normally it won't, it won't exist. So if there is a project management system existing, uh, that means out of the huge asset, you have taken out certain principles, rules and regulations and you have put them together and you have chosen them for the project management. I'm not saying you have mandated them as yet, but you have chosen them uh, mutually that this is how we will do the project and that would be a very good thing. And that also gives rise to another concept which is called project management information system. How the information during, during a project would flow inside a project, what will happen? Naturally, if a project management system exists, then every project, project may have even have a software project management software uh, being used, which is managing their schedules and maybe uh, their information systems. But remember, all the project management software do not manage the information of the project. They just manage the schedule or maybe one or other things, cost and something else. But if you really want to com completely manage the whole structure of the project, all the information flow and stakeholders and everything, then probably you have to have your own system developed in your organization and such like system would be called a project management information system. So that's that much is so, uh, so far so good. Now let us see uh, from the governance point of view, organizational governance point of view, what we have talked about. Organizational governance is naturally, you know, they have certain targets, certain visions, certain um, objectives to reach. And to ensure that they have created a mechanism of organizational governance and they have mandated that everybody should abide by that. So those are the rules and regulations. They are otherwise present in organizational process assets, but now they are also being looked after. Somebody is watching, somebody is ensuring. So what if this organization is mature and it recognizes project management, therefore the organization, the organizational governance would have certain emphasis on project management as well. And that would definitely occur if there is a project management system and, and the organization at large recognizes the need for project management. Now, 
if that kind of environment occurs and uh, say you have got uh, uh, such like mature organization where you have got a PMO or something like that. Now, what is the responsibility of PMO? PMO would rather be looking. Uh, uh, did we discuss PMO before? We talked about the PMO. Yes. Right, right. Project management office responsibilities, you remember? I said primarily PMO is a link between the projects and the boss. Naturally, feeding information upward and naturally giving him a picture of the, of the whole thing going. But at the same time, the same channel could be used to communicate downwards. As well as, uh, the most important thing is, it can also be a conduit to standardize all project management practices, formats, rules, regulations and everything. Adopting Adoption of standards, adoption of software, adoption of PMIS, all those things. If PMO exists, then it is a conduit which ensures that all the project management assets, sorry, organizational process assets are maintained at a central location, which is PMO. All knowledge base is managed by it. It develops those guidelines and standards and formats and everything and mandates them to the project naturally through the order of the CEO or whatever. So this is a channel through which these organizational process assets would be managed and maintained. And that would be a, a very important instrument in uh, meeting the projects to the organizational governance, delivering the projects according to the organizational governance. So anyways, when we talk about the organizational governance, we are not specifically talking about project. We are talking about that organization is uh, on track and uh, it is checking that all all the KPIs are in place and everybody is following that. Now, how everybody is following the operations uh, would be checked in a different way. Project would be checked in a different way. But PMO, because it has developed a project management system or a project management information system and or. Uh, now, the project management system is instrumental, is instrumental in giving such guideline to specific projects as if they can develop their project management plan. In other words, how to develop a project management plan is all given in the project management system. So seeking guidance from the project management system, it is convenient for any project manager to first develop the project management plan, what is to be included in it and all that, what tools are um, uh, available, what tools can be used and should be used in, uh, in this specific type of project, maybe you know they have classified this kind of project can use these tools, this, this kind of project can use these tools. So whatever the system says, according to that, we can devise our own project management plan. But on top of the project management plan, there has to be a project governance. So in between the project management system and the project management plan, there is a, a project governance. This project governance will look, keep a watch inside of the project, how project objectives are being met. And it will have its own check and balance system. Just like organizational governance has its KPIs and monitoring mechanism and everything. And if somebody is not following it, that is actually a kind of a crime. So project, manage, project, project will develop its own governance mechanism naturally under the umbrella of the organizational governance or whatever is a higher hierarchy like the program management, the program governance would be there, portfolio governance might be there and then the organizational governance. So all umbrellas are one after the other but project should have its own governance mechanism no matter uh, with, with whom it is aligned but project, every project should have its own governance mechanism and remaining within that governance mechanism and following the project management system then it develops the project management plan, which is basis for everything which is to be planned in the project and later on execution and monitoring and control of that. So th this is the linkage I wanted to establish between the organizational process assets and all other things. Sir, yeah. uh, it mentions about artifacts. Artifacts or documents? Uh, artifacts are at times considered uh, to be the physical uh, 
physical things that have been made, like for instance a platform has been made or a machine has been installed mm. or a bench has been installed. Of course, of course. Would those include of course. operations with process assets part of it because it says so? From the project management point of view, it will uh, mostly be documented, documentations. But yes, if you are doing a project and you um, um, create an output and that output is then amended and so on and so forth. So every version of the deliverable might also be kept in the artifacts. Like, you know, you are trying to make a car and when you, you know, uh, develop its uh, wheel, that wheel is faulty. So what we do is we uh, do the defect improvement and all that and we come up with another wheel and still it is not going our job and then we come up with another wheel. So all these faulty wheels are our artifacts with you know date, when it was made, what was the fault, what was done and then it's just like keeping a museum of all these artifacts. But yes, that counts, that is there. I have seen uh, exactly the same kind of thing that probably you might be using in camera. Uh, these artifacts might be maintained. I, I saw it in uh, um, uh, Army Services Corps Driving School. They have got a complete artifact of you know what what has been developed and all the complete museum kind of a thing, how things were developed and all that. So yes, those are also artifacts. But from project management point of view, uh, because uh, this wheel is not going to be used for all the projects, this is only for this kind of project. So that is okay. This artifact. But this artifact might not be usable. Documents are more usable. But the machines? Machines, uh, uh, they become uh, either the tools or uh, resources. So they would rather be counted as resources. Organization, process, assets? Not really. If You see, anything which is a resource, if there is an engine you have developed, and now it is in operation, and now you are using this engine in another project, then this is not... Uh, 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 the process asset. Yes, this is organizational asset, okay. This it's not, is, a it's not a process asset. If that thing is being used for for some kind of process, then yes. you can call it a process. That is precisely my question. That okay. in, our, in our scenarios, we have bays. <coughs> mm -hmm. We have bays. A bay is a big area. Right. Where certain uh, jigs and fixtures and certain specifically developed tooling. <coughs> right. Special tools have been developed. Mm -hmm. Like there are certain simple tools like a simple screwdriver or tire mm -hmm. or something. Right. But then there, there are certain specialized tools developed to do certain kind of job on an aircraft. Right. A special kind of ladder development, mm -hmm. special kind of platform development, special mm -hmm. kind of uh, top wrench development, a special jig and fixture. Now these things are specifically developed for a certain particular uh, project and now this project is over. But this development went in, well, this development was achieved after a long time and after a lot of design and engineering and now it is a learning curve achieved at a certain level and right. for another aircraft of a different sort and a new project comes in, this particular development will help that particular okay. new okay. project. Uh, wonderful. So, whatever you have developed, a ladder or whatever, um, have you documented it? Its design and everything? Yes. Has it been uh, come on paper? Yes. So, it so is documented. Papers are they are more important to create another ladder another in ladder. future. But the point is... But as such, that is uh, that ladder has become a part of your store. And that is an organizational asset. As it such, will be, it, will be, it will be a resource. Yes, that is, that is clear and true. Right. I understand the point that you give. But here was the point say that they include artifact. Artifacts. Artifact is always... Artifact means... Something physical. Pa paper, paper is also an artifact. Document is also an artifact. Mm -hmm. And I, I think document is the strongest artifact because it, it documents everything. You, know, you can reproduce things out of it. Artifact practicing knowledge. Yes. 
I, I, I tend to agree with you, but artifact does not only mean things. It means, it, uh, it also, it, yes, exactly. Documents, documentation is a major kind of artifact. Right? So, from project, another, another argument I have, and that is, we are talking about general project management practices. We don't know what kind of technology you are working on. Right? And if uh, I separate the technology and I only talk about the project management, the only assets are paper documentation. I don't have any screwdriver in it. I don't have any other kind of thing. So all the assets from the project management point of view are uh, documentation. Now the th second thing is, but the projects will have technology. So if you have our technology on which you are doing the, this project, you can introduce those organizational processes in your organization because that is your organizational processes. We are not saying that your organizational processes are not valid and these are the only things which can be. But when we are talking in a generic term, then we are specifically telling you plans, processes, this, 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 all these things are your assets. Now, if you think that anything else could be your process asset, the important thing is they should be process as it. So if it is helpful in doing some process, then it is a process and you, you are treating it like that, fine. Maybe you know a computer is a process as it for that matter. And essentially speaking, a computer is a process as it because it maintains the documents, the stores the documents all the time. So probably whatever documents I am putting into it, maybe. But uh, from project management point of view, just uh, let us just assume that we are essentially and mostly talking about documentation. That's why I did not specifically say that organization processors are always document. I said essentially they are mostly documents. Mostly so I, I just left out that uh, small little base for other kinds of articles. Just like you, you gave an example of computer. Uh, exactly. We really go into this kind of development. Uh, we have a computer. Mm -hmm. We have kind of a tester along with that computer mm -hmm. and there are connectors developed on, on, on that right. kind of connectors could be connected for any new project those, those connectors are standardized like USB, mm -hmm. USB port and there are so many other kinds of ports right, right. at the back of in the computer there are certain softwares developed mm -hmm. to test certain cases right. now these softwares are developed for this particular case which can be easily utilizable for certain Different cases. Fine. Different fine. For new projects also. Right. So those kind of computer programs would yes. also be organizational processes. Yes, of course. But at the same time, though again I would say everything has to be documented. That had to be brought on paper. A computer can go corrupt, can go you know yes, uh, wrong. Yes, so um, whatever you produce, you know, it is not like uh, you know uh, some uh, uh, metaphysical kind of a you know. Uh, thing that uh, we can't read exactly right we create the, the, the software we develop on all that kind of exactly software, yeah. and we create the archives, archives for that, for that. And those archives are the so PC. therefore archives are more important than the computer itself yes of course <laughs> that's why i'm saying call archives the artifacts they yeah. are the basic artifacts they are the artifacts. rest everything can be recreated Anything which can be recreated, that... Like the, these proprietary kind of stuff, which, that is called the process and which yes. you learned over time. Exactly, exactly. The lessons learned, they are the policies, they are the procedures, they are everything. Now, uh, these things can be divided into, organization processes can be divided into two parts. And what I like to explain it is, uh, if you go to a library, there are two sections. The reference section and the normal section. What do you get um, in a reference section? Exactly the uh, the archives of the things that have been done earlier in the reference section. Right. Yes, uh, Yes, sir. The same thing I was uh, I wanted to share. Okay. Uh, as as Adil said, and regarding these artifacts, sir, I just had a, a 
quick Google check while the while the discussion was going on. Okay. okay. It is actually the software, sir. The software. What it says is artifact yes. is the software. One of many kinds of tangible byproduct produced during the development of a software. So I think Adil sub correctly pointed out that mm. uh, the softwares used to yeah. archive your lesson learned will be the art artifact. By the way, software is also a way of archiving. Correct. That is also a way of archiving. So naturally that is. But at the same time, my point was that it also has to be protected and uh, some something has to be you know stored somewhere else. Maybe in document, maybe in another computer or a backup system or whatever. So, yes, yeah, so storage, storage media could be any. Yeah, storage media could be any. Exactly, that is a, exactly. But it has to be. Yes. That is the exactly. 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 So, okay. I was talking about the reference section. Uh, yes, sir. In a reference section is a something, sir. You, if you go into the library of thousands of books, mm -hmm. you will not be able to 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 locate the book. You know, so the reference section is the one from where uh, you try to uh, sort or narrow down your uh, intended uh, uh -huh. topic, and then you you can reach to the specific section and get the required information. Think again. That is not right. See, there are a lot many books in a library. There are a lot many things you can, you know, um, get them issued, take them home, and the, maybe there are twenty copies of that book lying there. They are commonly. All right, sir. I, I get your point, sir. In this what? section, you are talking about the one which is not being issued. They, yes. They're kept for reference, and everybody else can use. Yes. The scarce resources. One only one book of one kind is available in the. That will never be issued. That will be kept in the reference library. You can take advantage of that while sitting there. So that is kind of a thing you can't take home. So okay, I would translate that. There are those resources which you can freely use anywhere, and you can probably you no. Know, I'm making an addition. You can probably make some additions, subtractions to them as well. Although in library we don't we don't rewrite the books or something. But there is a group of resources which you share and which you update also. This is one group of, uh, of, of data. And there is another kind of artifacts which you can't change, which you just can refer. You know, what could be those things which you can't change but you can refer to? And what are those uh, organization processes which you can share, change, amend, put them back? So these these are two two different sections. Oh, two types of uh, two types of organization processors. So let me go to the next slide and we'll probably. Uh, actually, this will become very clear. Uh, all the policies, procedures, regulations, rules. These things are not amendable by the project manager. They are to be followed. So they are given in the category of policies and procedures. Like references? Like references, yeah. yes. On the other hand, uh, there are old lessons learned, you no know, historical data, old files, previous project record, and all that. You yeah. can always yeah. reuse it. They are being created every time. They are created every time and they are always, you know, they are in the, into the archive. You can always consult them. And you can uh, add your uh, feedback, uh, put your files also into it when your project finishes. So this is continuously being updated. And the first thing is you, you can consult it as well. So it's a big archive of all previous projects and you can consult everything and you know all kinds of documentation. Now uh, coming back to the policies and procedures, um, the standard standardized formats, templates, are also part of policies and procedures. Project progress report will be submitted in this format. You can't change the format. You have to follow the format. So that format will always be taken from there and you just have to fill back. Now when you fill it back, that becomes the asset, the other kind of asset which you have submitted for record, which others can see in future. But the format itself was part of the policy. Exactly. Which is, which stays the same. Exactly. 
uh, it says they also include the organization's knowledge base such as lessons learned and historical information. This you are creating the knowledge base. You can consult the knowledge base. You can uh, create the knowledge base. And uh, this is kind of uh, on and off, uh, in and out kind of a thing. Whereas a, a policy and procedures, yes, they can be changed from up there. But you don't have the power to change them. You just have to follow them. So two categories, one is called uh, one is called policies and procedures, another is called knowledge base, corporate knowledge base. Just hold on a minute, I'll just fix it. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just, you know, uh, just to stay up your mind, uh, these kind of things could be there. And there could be a lot many other documents which you could come up. And these are not uh, all specific to the project. They could be organizational documents, procurement policy, HR policy, and things like that. So all those documents, procedures, whatever, this could be. And this is just to tell you that uh, in all the process groups, there are a lot many things which are in the organization process which can be used in all the process group and essentially with uh, for all the processes of the project. So it will be required everywhere. Then we have got the corporate knowledge uh, knowledge base. And what is the corporate knowledge base? Corporate knowledge base is where we keep the data generated within the organization. We do project, we do work, whatever we do. Whatever are the results of that, the field documents or uh, lessons learned or historical data or whatever, that all is going to inside the archive. And we must consult and we should consult uh, previous projects data, which unfortunately uh, our project managers are not really in a habit of consulting previous documents. Uh, if at all they do, they do it just for copy paste. Like, you know, I've seen many government organizations when they have to create a PC one, they will hunt down a similar PC one and copy it exactly with small little amendment. They would say this is what it is. It is not for photocopying everything. It is for guidance. So um, an analysis, you know, you must be able to do the statistical analysis with the previous data and see what should I do? What is, what is best for my project? So it is not just not a matter of copying and pasting, but um, maintaining this knowledge base, getting help from, from this knowledge base and submitting something to this knowledge base as, uh, as a result of your project. So uh, configuration management knowledge base is, um, okay, can you let me know what is, a, what is configuration management? What is configuration? Configuration management is that uh, once you create a prototype of uh, New design of okay. certain thing. Mm -hmm. You create that prototype, and that is called configuration one. Okay. Once it is finalized, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that prototype once it goes to be a, a finalized product, mm -hmm. it is considered to be the version one of that. Version one of that. And right. Later on, once you start to improve it with certain, you know, in the same uh, mm -hmm. same model or same design, mm -hmm. bring up it in improvement. That is called the next version. Right. That is, uh, once you maintain the documentation for the first version okay. and the changes that you get incorporated in the second version and the third version and the fourth version mm. and the life cycle of the entire uh, product life cycle. So during those times, during the time of the life cycle, right. various versions are maintained through configuration control. Right, right. Shahan, what is your opinion? Uh, I agree with the deal, sir, sir. Whatever he said is right. Uh, what I, I just wanted to add two more things, sir. Mm -hmm. Whatever we want to 
we want to customize it to the specific need or tailor it to the specific need like a, the one project could be different from the other project so okay. we have to uh, configure it to, to the specific project requirements mm, that is a new idea I didn't get this idea. He says uh, from the organizational process as it, the previously something is done that is one configuration at all, <laughs> tailoring it to my own requirement that is another configuration. Okay, fine, you know, we can go with it, but this is not a classical configuration management uh, thing uh, we are talking about. Actually, Adil gave it a very uh, elaborate thing on that. Let me explain it in a very, very simple terms. Say, you have set up a classroom and you have designed it for 25 people and you have designed it that this is how they will be sitting. There are, you know, uh, five chairs in, in the front row and then there are going to be 10 rows and, you know, whatever, uh, five rows and there will be 25 people sitting down there and there will be a stage on this place. And the, the setting of everything in that room as per the design is the first configuration of that room right then the first class happens there and when the first class happens everyone you know moves the chair and sits somebody is sitting oblique something so the configuration of that room has changed when they leave the classroom the chairs and settings and everything which was originally the configuration it is not according to that so now the room is in yet another configuration. Next day, somebody comes and fixes the chair back to the original configuration. And then next day, the uh, next class, uh, instructor wants the class to happen in a U-shape classroom. So everyone moves the chairs and converts into a U-shape configuration. So whatever is happening in that room, if I had a camera, which could have, you know, or taken a picture every you know twice or thrice a day and I have uh, that thing in front of me and all the pictures one two three four five I can say how the room's configuration is moving on how the things are changing and but whichever configuration you decide to be the ideal or which is your base configuration you always revert back to that configuration. That is your that is usually called your baseline. So the say the initial configuration we designed, we wanted to keep that the baseline. So every time uh, next day the class starts, everything should be in the same configuration. And then you can change and do things, but you come back to the same configuration. Say the configuration is ultimately the baseline has been changed. Now Management has decided that we will have a U-shaped configuration set up. This is the next version of the configuration. This is, this so, is the baseline. This is not the baseline. This is the re-baseline of, of that. But I still have to keep a record. What was the first baseline? That is in the books. What is the second baseline? What is the third baseline? What is the fourth baseline? And remember what I have given you this example is it is not only the baseline. It is Whatever is happening within the baseline is also configuration. If I can keep the record how the chairs have moved in the room in the whole day, I can analyze this data and statistically say what should be my next configuration. So this is uh, normally this is okay to say that uh, from baseline to baseline we keep the configuration one two three four five, but. Uh, what I need to highlight here is, which is going to be very important when you are studying scheduling, that it is not only the baseline to baseline, but sometimes within the baseline, you also have to keep a close watch on the configurations because those configurations can help you elsewhere in making certain decisions. So therefore, we uh, whatever happens to our setting, that keeping a record of that is called configuration management. And this is not only the configuration management of a room. Uh, if you are doing a project, then every plan has got its own configuration management me mechanism. Every plan within the project management. It is not on the project management plan. It is the scope management plan, the schedule management plan, the cost management plan. Every plan has to be configured. And sometimes 
each artifact may have to be configured. This is a version 1 of this form or this report and this is numbered version 2, this is version 3 and sometimes within two versions there are version 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Yes. So keeping the record of all the versions and baseline is the configuration manual. So there might be standards, policies, procedures and project documents to support that. There could be financial databases, historical information and lessons learned. Uh, lessons learned naturally, these are the databases where you put uh, whatever uh, you have, you know, uh, you archive all your lessons in a written format and it should be done. Normally, again, we miss out this very important thing in, uh, in our project because when we are done, we just forget about everything. We don't properly record that. But I'm uh, very happy about one thing that uh, in Defense Forces, there is a term known as debriefing. And debriefing is really uh, uh, this lesson learned thing. And that is archived also. So most of the practices in Defense Forces, uh, although they may not know what they are doing as far as the project management is concerned, but they are very akin to project management, very close to project management. Rather, I would say uh, they, uh, they mostly are in the projects of the time. So these are the lessons learned. And then you uh, um, record all the documentation and historical data is maintained in some archive. It's not only the lessons learned, other data also, or what the list of all the risk, risk registers, issue registers, other catalogs, other things. So all these things are called historical information and lesson learned, which could include the project records and documents, all project employer information, information about results of previous project selection decisions, previous project performance information, information from the risk management effort, and these are just examples, few examples. There could be any number of things. Issue and defect management database, again, could be a part of the historical database uh, information, or it could be maintained as a separate database. What had been the issues, issue log, what had been the issues in your project or whatever, even operations, and how did you resolve it? What is the record of that? Who, how long it did, did it take? And so on. Similarly, what were the defects in the products you were producing? And how was that managed? How was that improved and corrected? So these databases, so that would entail issue and defect status, control information, issue defect resolution, action items results, and so on and so forth, or whatever you you call such like documents in your organization. <clears throat> then uh, process measurement databases. What were the measurement results of various processes? You might have used your own testing tools or measurement tools for whatever the project you are doing. So those records are also put into a kind of a database. Then all the project files you produce during the working on the project, there could be the various baselines, the final version of scope, final version of cost, final version of schedule, quality, um, the performance measurement baselines, um, project calendars, and so on and so forth, network diagram, the risk registers, all these things are your project files. So they are also archived. So I hope this clarifies what a project organizational process asset is. And uh, probably we have talked about it in quite a bit of detail. Now, the, a very similar term, a term or, uh, you know, a re related term is enterprise environmental factors, but essentially these are not the documents. Enterprise environmental factors are those internal or external factors which either enhance or constrain your project management option, which affects your project in any way, in good way or a bad way. But those factors, and remember, these factors are normally not in your control. They just happen. So if, you know, like external factors, climate, if climate is bad, I can't uh, do the construction. So I can't do nothing about it, but I have to uh, tailor my project accordingly. If there is a snowfall expected in a specific period of time, I should not be constructing. Why should I plan something like that? So um, those internal and external factors which could impact the project, they are called internal uh, enterprise environmental factors. Now naturally, we can simply divide them into two parts, internal factors and external factors. Internal factors are organizational factors. 
which are imposed on you from the organization side, like um, organizational policies and procedures. Organ uh, now you would say policies and procedures were there uh, in the organization process as it is. That's right. But the imposition factor is internal, although we may be consulting it. So you can relate it to a document, but this is a factor. Organizational governance imposes that you should do something in that way or report something a specific way, uh, 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 which uh, the thing is not really documented like culture, culture of the organization. It might not be documented. So culture is impacting you. The working style is impacting you. The you know way the people behave with each other, interact with each other, that might be impacting. These things might not be documented. So uh, enterprise non-profit factors are not essentially documents, but some of the, those things could be found in organizational processes. But their effect, how they affect the project is the factor. These are the internal factors. External factors you could have you know from customer sites and certain impositions, uh, maybe government mandates something and regulates a new policy and according to that your project is going to be greatly disturbed or affected or maybe enhanced or constrained. Maybe they give you tax exemption, project is good for the, for the project. Maybe they impose some taxes, bad for the project, but whatever. So these are the external factors. So as I said, these factors could be positive or negative. These factors could be internal or external and they either surround or influence the project success. Project success is impacted by them. This is one thing established that these things will somehow affect the project success. These factors can come from any or all of the enterprises involved in the world. If there are more than one organizations, uh, uh, you know, uh, jointly doing this project, then any one organization is you know, liquidated, project will be impacted. Any or all of the enterprises involved in the project. So it includes the organization culture, st structure, processes, geographic distribution of facilities and resources. Where uh, the equipment and things are actually lying. Where the resources actually exist. Do you have to work on a virtual basis or a physical basis? Government and industry standards like regulatory agency regulations, code of conduct, product standards, quality standards, workmanship standards. You may say that all these standards are found in document, but they are not our organizational process assets. Yes, we can add them to our organizational process assets, but these are the factors impacting us. So uh, at some places you may find certain things uh, which are the factors could also be documented. But that is exactly why I say enterprise and non-profit sector are not essentially documented. And project uh, organizational process assets are mostly documented. So uh, these are organizational process assets and where am I? I can stuck. So what other examples are um, existing human resources? We may have their skills, discipline, knowledge and knowledge, they might, may, might have the knowledge of design, development, other things. So these things can impact. Uh, these could be the factors. These are the internal factors of the human resource. Then personnel administration, we can have staffing and retention guidelines, employee performance reviews, training records, reward and over, overtime policy, time, time tracking. All these things are going to positively or negatively impact our project. One very important enterprise and order factor, which is internal, is a company work authorization system. This thing is not uh, a part of the project management by itself, but it is given to project management as an input. But this is very important for project management. If your organization has a proper work authorization system uh, applied in, in the organization, project will inherit it. For example, um, and this is very important for the project as well. For example, uh, some factories use the time card system. So what is time card system? Basically it's a work authorization system. So they take people as their resources, human resources, and they say 
when a person has logged in he is in the factory and when he logs out he is out of the factory that means the time he has spent in the factory he must be producing this much is a expectation attached to it so a kind uh, is a kind of a work authorization that person as soon as he recorded his entry he has been given permission automatically to work and when he leaves not to work so the work is counted from that time similarly if uh, the, this more of an intellectual work or other kind of work we are doing then probably um, you are the boss and you are uh, you have given a job to be done by one of your employees uh, on say next friday is it enough that you have told him that you will do this job on next friday or on next friday he starts the job and doesn't tell you do you want to know he has started the job or not that is the work authorization system that is the work authorization system when you start your job you must tell me that you are starting it and when you finish it must tell me that you have finished it and if there is a proper documentation for that he has to fill a form and get it signed by you this is called work authorization system so some organizations have this kind of system and if this kind of system is in vogue in an organization the project it will be inherited to the project and projects would benefit a lot from it because it is not enough to issue a schedule for the project and then rely on the people will, will they know they will do it by themselves nobody will do it by themselves naturally in project we will have to have our communication mechanism which will ensure that everybody is knows what he needs to do and he is reminded when he needs to do it but there has to be a work authorization system by which he will if not me he will inform his supervisor that he has started working on the construction of the wall and now he has finished it so this work authorization system is very important and there, uh, if this is in both it comes from the organization it is an internal enterprise environmental factor so one question here yes uh, uh, i don't know i'm not getting the screen that is in this way okay let me take some time okay uh, till the time is over there is another work authorization uh, you are talking of on the work authorization with respect to the time of the job that exactly. you get on exactly and then you once you submit the job uh, that exact time working. and moment of that like somebody is working on a lathe machine put punches card coming to the lathe floor do the lathe job exactly and you know once it goes out and we punches the time again exactly. up Work of the same time is recorded. Right. Similarly, if there if there is a test job and you have given certain task, you go, you you know, at times there this is called office automation. You tell them you are working on this thing. It is recorded and you submit it. The time. Exactly. Exactly. That is another thing. But there is another kind of work authorization that we you know that comes to my mind once we are doing stuff in the factory, which gives you an authorization. A license to work on certain thing, mm -hmm. like it is a training license. It, it is a it is a license that you are trained on performing this particular task on the aircraft. That we call it type rating. Right. Type But rating. So that is that, that is an open license. That, that means open license. that he can do and at, at any time he he is authorized to do this. Do this particular these particular this particular job. Particular jobs he right. Times. But whenever he does starts doing any one of those sequences, he again, should he not inform anyone? Yes, he again informs it. Okay, that is work authorization. Both, both, both are there. That, this is work authorization. One, once he has to have, first of all, he has to have a license to do it. Right. And secondly, once he starts the job and finishes it. He logs it. Okay. That initially I did this thing, then I right. did this thing, then I did this step, and then I finished the job. That is a condition you have put on your work authorization system. You have said this job can only be done by licensed people. Acha. And then those licensed people, when they start working, they have to fill this form. We call it form forty-five. Right. And then we once you record it, it's called form forty-three. So, so this is part of your work authorization system. The whole thing, whole thing, whole thing. This is a condition you have put within your. This is a good, good thing because this is more elaborate. 
Imagine this is going to be useful in whatever project you are doing in that organization. So that would all that hierarchy or in the system would be inherited to the project, and they have to follow the same rules. So that is good. Uh, yes. The same same sort of thing is being used in the oil and gas industry as well, sir. Mm -hmm. We call it as a PTW, permit to work, okay. and only the the authorized person can go and work. And at a specific time. Mm -hmm. So once the permit is given, it is going to be displayed at a specific location from mm -hmm. where uh, at a central location, sir. Okay. So uh, other people will not be working on the system. So what okay. they, they do is first they go there, they do the electrical isolation, whatever they want to work on the system, it should not have any electrical hazards, mm -hmm. pressure isolation and gas isolation, all okay. these. And they other people who they see there could be uh, three four teams working on a on a specific plant mm -hmm. so other people should not be energizing or electrical pressure or anything to, to the specific area where these people are working so this yeah. to regulate all this they have this system ETW, permit to work and a specific train coordinator is put yeah. who is called PTW coordinator exactly. so this is how, how they do it sir so I think it's similar to what uh, yeah, my exactly. friend said. So you see, work authorization system brings uh, discipline. And if an organization is disciplined, then naturally the projects will be disciplined. The discipline would be inherited. So this is the discipline we are we are getting from the enterprise and entry factors as an internal factor. Then we have got marketplace conditions, which is an external factor, stakeholder risk tolerance, external factor, political climate, external factor. Organizations established communication channels internal vector. This is organizations established communication channel, and this is a never ending list. This is these are just few of the enterprise and non factors listed here. Then from like more commercial databases, we can have standardized cost estimating data. We can have industry risk study information, risk databases, internal or external. Project management information system is also <laughs> uh, enterprise environmental vector. It is an automated tool such as a scheduling software tool, a configuration management system, an information collection and distribution system, a web interface to other online automated systems. Now, what does this PMIS do? What do you think? What, it, what is it like? Is it a project management software? He's talking about a complete ERP. Yeah. It's a whole of, uh, organizational flow system, a fully automated system. So this is, uh, people think that this is probably done by MS Project or Prime Avira. Well, yes, they are very good software and they have got a lot many capabilities, but not all. They are more, more inclined about scheduling. Scheduling. Scheduling and then they keep adding few features into it, but it is not whole. Yeah. It is not maintaining my documents. It is not keeping the configuration management of that, uh, communication and all that. Although they, the enterprise versions of these software, they have brought in a lot many improvements. But still, for several, uh, you know, new capabilities, uh, they have bought separate softwares, which add into your MS project and other things. And uh, there are other packages which are called, you know, there is a one by the name of M... Uh, MPMM or something like that. Uh, MPMM. Uh, I just forget, um, I'm just forgetting it. That is a very interesting software they have developed. Rather, it's a web interface uh, where they have provided a mechanism for uh, establishing the policies and procedures of the organization for the project management, organization process assets. So. They have provided templates for everything based on PMBOK and Prince2. So all the templates are available free of cost. You can download that, uh, that thing and uh, those things are available. Now if you want to uh, you know, customize it and put your own organization logo on, onto it, uh, you can buy it. That is then quite a bit, of, a bit expensive. But the advantage is that would be available on your 
local area network or whatever kind of network you have and anyone anywhere could access if you want, uh, anyone who wants to fill, uh, create a charter he would see what is the current latest version of the charter that would be displayed and you know, he will just start filling into it and there it goes so, templates and they are automatically updated just like enterprise uh, software I think four or five thousand dollars what do you call that? MPMM. MPMM.com probably. We can we can see that here. Uh, yes, actually um, I had been monitoring their progress for quite some time. They had initially targeted that after MPMM they were uh, bringing something for program management and portfolio management and OPM3 and all that. They are making PMPO, PMP is redundant. <laughs> no, that is a very good effort. I think PMPs can use it. For the time they have used it for another five years. No, this is an evolving thing. Right? It's a customized kind of a thing for every organization. And it is an evolving kind of a thing. You need to have someone educated to run the machine. But it's going to you know, teach the lot. Exactly. And you know, put the entire lot into the framework of project management yes. automatically. Exactly. But I have recently seen that they have stopped their progress on all other ends and they are just concentrating on project management, which I don't really like because they were going on a very good path of you know promoting it to the program and portfolio on all types of documents, whole thing. Very difficult for programming, uh, specifically for portfolio. You see, if it is customizable, then there is no problem. You can come up with new forms. You can create your own forms. That is a part of it. It is doing the configuration management. It is maintaining all the forms and you want to release whichever form you can release there. You can mandate anything. You can say, okay, from today onward, this is a new form. Everybody has to fill. I think it the areas be of program and in that program management, those areas are very less defined. They're, they're, uh, they're too specific to conditions of the environment. Actually, I would say they are not well known. Well, uh, we are not well acquainted with them. Otherwise, as far as the definition is concerned, a project cannot be defined until unless a program and portfolio uh, thing, uh, the whole link is existing. We are running projects and we are uh, completely uh, hopeless, <laughs> not connected with anything. We only, uh, well, you know, uh, we started talking about the organization strategy and all this drama. Who talks about organization strategy in project management? The projects organizations are doing project is an independent kind of a thing and you know whatever the boss has said that is uh, that is the strategy that is everything now boss is responsible for uh, the strategy everything. project manager doesn't bother about it so if you really uh, look at these things in a connect connectivity to the organizational strategy objective vision mission and all that then probably we start realizing portfolio how important portfolios and programs are and then uh, the whole thing is to be made the enterprise versions of pro program and uh, of uh, MS project and Primavera uh, actually house the capability for programs and portfolios, but uh, not from the documentation point of view. Yes, they have they have done few things in which uh, some kind of configuration management system and document filing system is also now available, but I still won't call it a project management information system as such. Uh, that has to go a long way now, still. There's so many things in a project management system and probably this uh, this thing has to be developed by uh, each organization on their own needs, customized to their own needs. So this is uh, something which comes from the enterprise environmental vector. Okay, so this concludes the discussion on organization processes and enterprise environmental vectors. And again, I would emphasize that these are the two things which are two inputs which are required almost by every project management process and from some of the project management processes they are updated also. Even enterprise and factors are also updated from very few one two processes but they are updated and how they are updated especially uh, from the human resource processes because human resource process would affect your organizational culture. 
how you manage your team, the lessons learned are going to the process assets. But the way you are managing your team, the result of that may affect a change into the organization culture or style or something. So that is where enterprise non factor could be affected by human resource process. Otherwise, mostly we will get the outputs for organizational process assets. But these, both of these things are going to be input almost everywhere. So that is for these two things. Should we start the next topic? Uh, we have the project stakeholders and governance. We have already talked about the organizational stakeholders, organizational stakeholders and organizational governance. Now, the perspective has now changed. There we said that when you are doing the project, do consider the organizational stakeholders. That means the project manager anyways is looking at the stakeholders. But he is looking at it from the perspective of the project. Who are the stakeholders to my project? But if you know and understand the organizational stakeholders, then you will get a very good input in whom to consider to be your project stakeholder. I'm not saying that all the organizational stakeholders are your project stakeholder, but that is a very good starting point to view all the organizational stakeholders and see whomsoever applies to my project. So whomsoever applies to your project is your project stakeholder. Similarly, we also talked about the organizational governance, the other kinds of governance umbrellas, and ultimately the project governance, which is the, you know, main control of the project. So project governance would be inherited naturally from under the laws and rules of the organization, but it will specifically address the project needs, how the project should be controlled, how it is to govern. And I, I also mentioned that there is, there is a relationship between governance and management. There are two separate things. Governance is how a person sitting up there ensures that whatever is happening under his sphere is happening according to the requirements. So he makes laws, procedures and check and balance systems, identifies KPIs, how to check it and all that. But he does not micromanage. Whereas a manager, manager deals with the team at a micromanagement level. He, he actually needs to have the physical progress reported to him he might you know involve him, himself into the work and ultimately he will report he will report to the higher level but the question is what if the project manager is lying if he's uh, giving wrong reports how uh, will the governance structure be you know okay with it governance structure should have some check and balance system so he should have some other KPIs identified. Like you see, project, you know, it's very common that we say uh, everything is okay. Every day you do everything is okay. So uh, the higher management feels that there is a lot of disturbance in ranks. People are not happy. So what is this indication of? Everything is not okay. That means there are other KPIs which must be identified under the governance structure, which must be looked at, which will indicate that the report project manager is giving to you might not exactly be true. So there should be some check and balance system. You should have some auditing systems, some health health check systems in place. Some outside consultants are, you know, some teams coming in and out. So we are not micromanaging, but we are checking the KPIs. We are ensuring that all KPIs are in place and they are healthy. It's a health check. Anyways. So here we have the project stakeholders, project governance, and the project success three topics. Uh, as far as the stakeholders are concerned, we already know the definition of it, but let us read it once again. Uh, stakeholders could be individuals, they could be groups, or they could be organizations who may affect or be affected by it. Or the third thing is more important, or they, they perceive themselves to be affected by it. A decision, activity, or outcome of the project. So, generally speaking, if not, you want, don't want to be confused. 
uh, I have my own definition. I say anyone and everyone who has anything to do with the project is a stakeholder. So he may affect or be may, he may be affected by the project or he thinks he may be affected by the project or he thinks he may affect the project even if his thinking is wrong but because he's thinking that that makes him a stakeholder because he will do something, something which will impact the project exactly so i have to you know go to each one of the stakeholders and convince them and ensure them that everything is okay or not so uh, even these people who perceive they are also about stakeholders as i said their people their organizations their groups who are actively involved in the project and whose interests may be positively or negatively affected now we did not mention the positive negative aspect earlier uh, this is also important some stakeholders are positive stakeholders some are negative stakeholders no matter they are affecting are affected by so they are internal and external they are uh, affecting are affected by are perceiving they are positive or negative so they are small or big so it does not matter whether a stakeholder is big or small internal or external uh, uh, affecting or affected by whatever when we are creating a list of stakeholders let us create an extensive and exhaustive list do not please do not forget anyone in the stakeholder list when you are creating this list do not forget anyone because we can always you know when we are grouping and you know sorting them we can always uh, you know shortlist some uh, the most important ones and leave out the others but if you leave out in the in the initial identification uh, that would be uh, uh, leave a big gap maybe you thought oh, this stakeholder does not matter forget about him and later on that stakeholder becomes a major stakeholder and you never identified it and then he will cause problems for so let us in the beginning when you are identifying the stakeholder let us identify anyone and everyone but one rule must be in your mind either he is affecting or he is affected by or he perceives anyone who has nothing to do with the project he is uh, he is not affected by he is not affecting he is, he doesn't even think that he can affect or he can affect it by why are you making him a stakeholder you are adding burden to the project for analyzing this stakeholder who is not a stakeholder at all so these three conditions if somebody fulfills may affect be affected by or perceive only these people should be considered as stakeholder so there are two things number one any stakeholder we just discussed any stakeholder anyone who is a stakeholder must not be left out in the stakeholder list anyone who is not a stakeholder must not be included in the list of stakeholders but at the same time i said uh, it has to be extensive and exhaustive list but that does not mean you put in the name of everybody Don't do that so only those who are you know uh, do anything with the project different stakeholders may have competing expectations this is again a big problem because we are talking about a huge crowd of stakeholders and everybody has go, uh, has his or her own interest at the uh, heart of each person so how do you satisfy all of them how is it possible that you can satisfy all of them they will have conflicts one will be asking one thing other will be asking completely 180 degree opposite thing and how are you going to satisfy these two to people this is a very uphill task this is the most difficult job a project manager has to do and project manager has to to you know uh, put in a lot of time in the communication with the stakeholders and uh, 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 about the project Stake uh, communication with the stakeholders and about the project it is generally said uh, normally we talk about in communication that 90% of the time of the project manager is spent in uh, in communications which includes conflict and negotiations and interactions and all that but 90% of the time is he is talking with people and only 10% of the time he is doing something 
This is what it is. You have to fight it out. It is a long laid out battle. And moreover, out of this 90% communication, there is a tendency that everything should be verbal. verbal. Everybody wants to talk to you and have fun with it. We want that all what is happening must be recorded. Only then it will be beneficial. But everything cannot be recorded. Right? So the rule is all the communication you have, at least more than 50% of it should be documented. If everything cannot be documented, more than 50% of the communication must be doc documented, must be written. We do allow verbal communications, but uh, the rule with the project management has set is 55% of the communication must be written. Remaining 45% can be verbal. If we don't put this law, everything will be verbal. And that will be too harmful. At least we will have some control, uh, more than 50% control, if we have 55% uh, of the uh, communication written. So that, um, although is a subject to be covered in communication, but... Uh, it's, it's better to, you know, document whatever you talk on the telephone. It's better to follow up with the exactly. writing. So you're documenting. So if, well, if you can document everything, nothing like it. But at least 55% is the baseline. Minimum. 55% communication must be communicated. Naturally, that would cover the plans and documents and all that goes on in an organization. Different stakeholders, okay. They may also exert influence over the project. It's deliverable than the project team in order to achieve a set of outcomes that satisfy strategic business objectives or other needs. So, actually, uh, this brings me to another subject, and that is uh, what kind of stakeholders could be there. Uh, uh, there are some who are your, uh, your supporters, who are some who are negative uh, stakeholders, who are your opponents, who oppose you, who are against you. There are some who are neutral. So how to behave with them, that is another science. You try to eliminate opposition. How do you eliminate opposition? At least bring the negative stakeholder to a neutral level. To convince him to come at least to a neutral level. Or if you can bring it up, make him a support. Neutral people must be brought into support. And supporter people, those who are supporting your cause, make them champions of your project. Make them the loudspeakers of your project. Make them happy and let them go out and speak loud in front of others. These are the people who are actually going to uh, fight your battle. Then you will be able to work and they will be you know, promoting your project. Okay, again stuck. Really? Right, next topic is project governance and naturally we have talked a lot about it from the organizational governance point of view and others. Uh, project governance uh, is the alignment of the project with the stakeholder needs and objectives is critical to the successful management of stakeholder engagement and achievement of organizational objectives. Now, how the project should be governed? Naturally, you have to look at the strategic objective, you have to look at the stakeholders, which includes the customer also, and naturally the needs of your people. So all of these things will be the basic thought for creating the project management plan. And the, this governance structure which naturally the boss of the project manager uh, should be the approver of this or should be the, I can say, the author of this. But normally, governance structure is suggested by the project manager 
to his boss and then he approves it. Project manager tells how should I be checked? What am I, am I doing and how should I be checked? And then project manager also says that I will be submitting the progress report. But how should I be checked? Like when can I be audited? How who will audit me and all that? He can suggest. And the project sponsor is normally the person who gives the project governance. And whatever is finalized in the project governance, this is exactly how project manager is going to follow and he is going to design his project management plan exactly according to that. According to the project governance. He cannot deny anything, any rule or principle given in the project governance. He cannot deny that because there is a check and balance system up there. Project governance enables organizations to consistently manage projects and maximize the value of project outcomes and aligns the projects with st business strategy. Now this is another perspective. Number one, every project has its own governance structure. If you have got a project management system evolved in a mature organization, that would be the birthplace of all governance structures. The, the governance structure for every new project would actually take its precedence from the project management system in vogue in the organization. And that would only happen if you have got a mature organization. Otherwise, that would not happen. Means that the governance, the development of the governance mechanism would be guided by the mature project management techniques? Um, uh, no. Number one thing is, governance is attached to the upper level governance. So, that stream is coming down. But now we are specifically talking about project. The upper level governance is not telling me how to manage a project. Mm -hmm. So for project governance, I have to look around what are the systems in both. So I will go to the PMO. Mm -hmm. So I will ask them what are your principles, rules and regulations. And if they are good, they would have a project management system. This is the mechanism we use. I say, okay, I will adopt this mechanism. Maybe they say that we have formulated this kind of project can be done this way, this kind of project can be done this way. I would myself think what kind of project I am doing and which is the project management system I should adopt and that I would induct in my governance structure. And my governance structure is not only coming from the project management system, it is coming from organizational governance also. So steam coming from organizational governance, something coming from... Uh, you are talking about the project, project governance. Project governance. Every project will have its own governance mechanism, which will definitely take precedence or help from the project management system. And also will not be always. Oh, exactly, process. exactly. And that will keep it aligned with the strategy also. That is a good way. And then, if there is a governance structure, project manager uh, will have you know uh, to abide by this governance structure and system and will then be able to develop a project management, project management plan. Project management plan cannot be created without these two things. Project governance and the project management. So kind of uh, we have provided a framework and project manager has to develop the project plan in exact accordance with these frameworks. He has to abide by that. And whether he is abiding by, by that or not, that is the responsibility of project governance to screw him, fix him if he is not doing right. And how do, do they do it? They have to identify their KPIs and accordingly they have to have some check and balance system. This normally I discuss in, uh, uh, there is a, another topic and that is project monitoring and control. And this is yet another thing, project evaluation. Project monitoring, evaluation and control. Evaluation is normally not part of the project management. Evaluation is normally uh, considered in government projects or other things. Because uh, evaluation is a level above monitoring and control. And that is normally handled by the project sponsor. And we are not talking about project sponsor and project management mostly. We are talking within the project and then within the project is the monitoring and control. But in government projects, you see, there is always an evaluation mechanism somewhere. So evaluation mechanism is one where you establish those KPIs. Establish those KPIs and put in a mechanism under in place how those KPIs will uh, come into effect. 
may be through consultant, may be through auditors or whatever. But naturally, the project management manager will be submitting his report. Then project manager also divides his project into phases, project life cycle. Those phases are instrumental to be checked by those KPIs. The project sponsor or the project board will always come in to check uh, the product of every phase and declare its completion. Without his permission, any phase cannot complete. Product cannot be approved. So there is uh, this is a check and balance system. The project sponsor says, our board says, I will not let you move to the next phase until and unless you satisfy me. So check and balance system. So there are many ways of doing that. But generally speaking, yeah, this was the project governance. It provides a framework that the project manager and sponsors can make decisions that satisfy both stakeholder needs and expectations and organization strategic objectives or address circumstances where these may not be in alignment. Important. This is very much possible that stakeholder needs and expectations and organization strategic objectives, they are not in alignment. And that is very common. You know, organization, uh, we are making <clears throat> a glass and organization wants this glass to make profit and organization is not much worried about how good our glass is. My customer who is a stakeholder, he wants it to be cheap and of the best quality. So there is a conflict. Organization doesn't bother about quality, they talk bother about profit. The person bothers about quality and he doesn't want to pay. So they, they are in conflict. So if such like conflicts are existing, then we have to resolve that. You know, uh, this is the responsibility of project manager to, you know, uh, uh, equalize these things. Okay, well, next. We have already talked about who are the project stakeholders. Stakeholders include all the members of the project team as well as all interested entities, internal or external to the organization. Project team identifies internal, external, positive, negative, performing, advising stakeholders in order to determine project requirements and the expectation of all parties involved. So anyone and everyone, as I already said, uh, a long list of all the stakeholders and not only identification, then we have to understand their needs and expectations and then collect requirements from them for the project. That is the linkage what we need to have. It is, uh, it is very wrongly anticipated and understood by, by our project managers that they are only answerable to their boss. Whoever, whoever is ordering them to do this project, he is the only person who he, they have to listen. They don't uh, like to talk to anyone else. Who is going to advise the boss of the project manager that, sir, you are, you are, uh, you are only looking at the profit, but customer wants quality also. Till, until and unless I'll talk to the customer or the stakeholder, how would I know what quality he needs? So I'm not uh, putting the quality into my project, quality of the product and uh, just listening to my boss. And he says, just make profit also ever. So, if you look at it, my boss is also a stakeholder and this guy is also a stakeholder and I have to, you know, uh, normalize both of them. I have to get his point of view and tell my boss about him and his point of view to him and ultimately find a middle ground and that would be normalizing the needs and expectations. Project manager should manage the influences of these various stakeholders. And that is the biggest job uh, the, this person has to do in relation to the project requirement to ensure a successful outcome. Responsibility and authority. Now, no matter what, what kind of stakeholder, big or small, internal or external, positive or negative, trust me, every stakeholder from the perspective of the project has some responsibility and some authority towards the project. Now, as far as the project team members are concerned, project manager is concerned, project sponsor is concerned, customer is concerned, you can say yes, okay, there are some responsibilities and authorities, but what about other stakeholders? Trust me, every stakeholder has some responsibility 
and every stakeholder has some authority. Like you see, a stakeholder sitting out there, he says, uh, you are constructing a mill here and uh, if this mill, uh, we, I am not bothered ab about what you are doing, but if there is a noise pollution or any other kind of pollution in my area, then I will fix you. So, he has an authority. He, he is not ready to bear any kind of pollution in his area due to your project. So, he is your stakeholder. He has the authority to go to police or whatever measures he can take. And what is his responsibility? He has to tell me what his requirements are. Otherwise, how can I take care of those requirements? He is responsible to tell me. So, even uh, if, if general public, if they are the stakeholders, then it is the responsibility of stakeholders of the general public to fill in the questionnaires or survey forms when I circulate. They can't complain afterward that, you know, we did not fill the form because we didn't think they were important. Because they, those survey forms are actually helping us reduce what people want. And if somebody has not filled it, it's not my problem. Then. So this is their responsibility to fill that and their authority to reject our project altogether. Like you see, uh, on the Murray Road, when they were having this metro thing going, um, whenever I pass through that place, I always thought, can these people reject this project right out, outright? Who are, you know, uh, greatly bothered by that project. People living right under the bridges and other that, the bridges and on the roads are completely closed and everything. Those people could have stood up and could have said, nee bane de de. Kya kar de de? So, this is the authority of the public. If they wanted, they could do it. And it was their responsibility to let them know what, what, what the requirements are. And interestingly, who bothers about the requirements of these needs and expectations of the customer? Nobody ever asked any Pakistani, do you want a metro? <laughs> Nobody ever. I never received a survey. I never know. But uh, some bright people with very, you know, vigilant minds, they came up with the idea and they just implemented it. So it, any idea which is affecting the stakeholders, stakeholders must be taken into confidence. There are so many ways of taking people on into conflict. It is not that, you know, uh, yes, I do agree. You see, when there is a, uh, you know, uh, uh, Defense Day March or all that, I am very, you know, uh, pleased to see uh, before that, that uh, there are TV programs showing the routes and instructing the people and all that, police and army and all those people, marking the routes and everything. And, you know, everything is told to the people on media. As if there is no disturbance on that day. Everybody already knows it. So, why can't we do it for other projects as well? We use media for personal projections. You have made the metro, now you are putting in big photos of yourself everywhere. But nonsense. This, this is not the right use of the media. You should have told people and taken people into confidence that these are the benefits and then somehow extracted the result out of it whether it is needed or not whether people want it or not there could have been some feasibility in surveys and you know uh, some kind of uh, documentation and statistics run i don't know if anything like that has ever been done for any of these projects which have been started like that <clears throat> I, I am very, very sure that no feasibility was done in it. The papers were filled later on after the project had started. This is how these PC1s get approved. PC1s get approved before they were ever made. And no, without even a, a PC2, feasibility studies were not made. And later on, they can fill in, you know, put in the documents here and there. Right. Their responsibility and authority may range from occasional contribution in surveys and focus growth to full project sponsorship, which include providing financial and political support. Stakeholders can have an adverse impact on the project objectives. Now, stakeholder identification, as I just mentioned, is important. As I said, a long list of stakeholders not for 
forgetting anyone adding everyone who matters and uh, uh, not adding anyone who, who who is not a stakeholder and this is not a one time process this is not that you do it in the beginning of the project and then forget about it this is a continuous process because stakeholders keep changing new stakeholders keep coming up old stakeholders keep dropping stakeholders keep changing their status also a person who was a small stakeholder today can become a major stakeholder tomorrow so we have to not only uh, do it as a continuous process but also keep measuring where the stakeholder stands so stakeholder analysis has to be continuous as well identifying stakeholders and understanding their relative degree of influence on the project is critical failure to do so can extend the timeline and raise the time the cost substantially then we have already talked about the positive and negative stakeholders uh, project manager's responsibility is to manage the stakeholder expectation and to balance between the project and negative stakeholders positive and negative stakeholders interest because even if there is a negative stakeholder uh, who doesn't want uh, your project to succeed because his business might be harmed from that so why can't we keep that person in confidence why can't we Uh, maybe he just perceives that he is a negative stakeholder and uh, he is opposing your project you can go and convince him that this project is not going not going to impact or maybe it is opening new doors for him or something like that <clears throat> so you have to create a balance and it is not always right to fight with the negative stakeholders probably the best way to deal with the negative stakeholder is to create synergies see how can they join hands with you and you can mutually benefit rather than you have uh, on a, be on a dagger's run from with that stakeholder and always trying to get let down the other other team ensure that the project team interacts with the stakeholders in a professional and cooperative manner that is very important project team uh, if not trained uh, to deal with the stakeholders must not be set in front of the stakeholders why because when they are in front of the stakeholder they will not know how to deal with the stakeholders and they would do something which is which can be harmful for the project number one number two they may commit something which is not in our agenda of the project because stakeholders uh, you know would like to take your team from here and there especially those projects which are done in a joint environment like you know joint application development like things where your team and the stakeholders or our customer for that matter are sitting together with your team members then they extract certain information from your uh, from project team well can it be done and your team will yes sir of course why can't it be done and that was not in the contract and then he starts expecting them and my person commits yes sir i can do it so that will be a problem so we have to train and educate our teams that they should not they they should uh, you know uh, deal with the stakeholders in a professional manner in a in a cooperative manner they should not say no to them but at the same time don't do not commit anything and facilitate them even if they have a genuine point facilitate that thing to your project manager and uh, if that uh, Uh, let let that uh, let that change be brought into the contract if that is a genuine thing and that is the proper change in the process but then you should not be insolent to them stakeholders you can't be here to be insolent to your stakeholder stakeholder is the god for you so whomsoever it is small stakeholder big stakeholder whatever kind of stakeholder stakeholder is the boss so you mm, there is no question no question that you can be insolent to your stakeholders and many people fight with me on that but uh, uh, stakeholder you can't take chances with you you you, you have to uh, understand their need and expectation and act accordingly stakeholder and the team is also yes yes of course anyone and everyone who has anything to do with the project primarily the internal stakeholders or the external stakeholders internal yeah exactly this uh, can you see this diagram yes. here i'll uh, talk about it 
then we have got internal stakeholders like you know internal to the project internal to the pro uh, project but external to the uh, sorry internal to the project and internal to the organization but these are only internal to the project project manager project team project management team uh, you know th those people who are working within the project these are the completely inner circle then we have got people from the organization internal to the organization but outside of the project this is our second tier in this project sponsor is the biggest biggest stakeholder project sponsor is not existing within the project he is existing within the organization but he is the key stakeholder with the project manager project manager is the key stakeholder uh, within the project project sponsor is the key stakeholder outside of the project and within the organization and naturally the ceo and all that and other people like you know operational management some people not all the operational management all the department those departments who will do anything with your project uh, uh, production department functional managers whomsoever i'm not saying all of the functional managers similarly there would be stakeholders uh, right uh, within we can have program managers portfolio managers pmo and all those things then we can have those stakeholders who are outside of the organization and the biggest one is a customer user and user contractor vendor supplier general public government government and you know media lobbying groups politic politicians they could be i'm not saying put everybody into the list of the stakeholder you go and see who can be included and then add their name to the stakeholders sponsor is a person or group that provides the financial resources and cash of in kind now sponsor is uh, a very uh, misunderstood kind of a term a misunderstood in the way but generally speaking uh, sponsor we consider anyone who is providing our resources or you know decision support or financial support or um, uh, who approves or validates something you know who has something major to do with the project what if i call them the key stakeholders what if i call those stakeholders who matter a lot as key stakeholders why i am saying that in english yes i agree that all of these people are stakeholders who have anything uh, controlling the finances controlling the decisions and all that but if there are more than one sponsor the life of the project manager is going to be very different technically he is answerable to someone else and administratively he is answerable to someone else and financially he is answerable to someone else so and they are, and they are not coordinated there is a problem a very simple solution is uh, generally although it is not a very well written rule but generally it says project sponsor so when it says project sponsor it means one person project manager should have only one boss and that one boss should be coordinating all other key stakeholders and where they are coordinated is generally called a project board so put all the key stakeholders are those people who want to call them sponsors let them call sponsors those sponsors are key stakeholders into a project board and this the person i am calling the project sponsor a single person he should be coordinated in communicating with them and he should be the single mouthpiece to give approvals to give permissions to give fundings for everything to the project manager he should be the champion of the project he should be the spokesperson of the project this that's why i am saying there should be one project sponsor and same is true for program sponsor portfolio and all that level it's so when a project is first conceived sponsor champions the project he serves as a spokesperson to higher level of management to gather support through the organization and promote benefits that the project will bring leads the project through the engagement or selection process until formally authorized this is a very important sentence the person who has been assigned as a project sponsor the day he has been assigned from there his job starts but he doesn't have a staff okay so so
जी शाह खान टाइम भी ज्यादा हो गया तंग तो नहीं आ गए नहीं सही ठीक है एज एज यू नहीं बस आई जस्ट क्लोज मैं स्पॉन्सर तक करके हम बस स्पॉन्सर को डिस्कस करके छोड़ देते हैं ओके सर Okay, uh, we were just uh, talking about yeah. As soon as the project sponsor is assigned this project, so far the no project manager exists, no no team exists. So till that time, he transfers the responsibility to the project manager. The whole burden of project is on single shoulders of this person, project sponsor. So leads the project through the engagement. Or selection process until the formally authorized. Till the time he issues the charter to the project manager. For this brief period, he is completely carrying the full load of the project. If he delays this process, then he is the only one who is to be asked, "Why did you not start the project?" So he tries that he should be authorizing the project as soon as possible, and after that, he is just managing by exception. Exception means that now he just can sit back and relax. Project manager will do everything. He will only check him when required or when he is consulted by the project manager for any approvals, changes, whatever. So he is not going to be actively involved in the project. So he will be managing by exceptions. Uh, then he plays a significant role in development of the initial scope and charter naturally because that is the time. when he was totally involved and fully you know uh, working uh, when nobody was existing i just want to cover the one last slide uh, sponsor and issues for issues that are beyond the control of project manager the sponsor serves an escalation path issue escalation issue escalation anything project manager cannot resolve management by exception comes to the sponsor and he will only deal with those issues which are left over by the project manager he can't project manager cannot so he is um, next step in the escalation path for issues a uh, sponsor may also be involved in other important issues such as authorizing changes whenever there is a change request the authority is a sponsor or the project board phase and reviews प्रोजेक्ट इज गोइंग और वेन द फेज एंड ही गिवस दिशन टू मूव एड और नॉट टू मूव एड मे बी the project did not go well in this phase and he decides to cancel the project terminate or project went well but he doesn't have any further funding to proceed to the next phase he says project terminated or uh, project uh, paused for some period of time so this is his decision project sponsor and when i say project sponsor it means the project board sitting up there so those key stakeholders um, deal with it project sponsor is normally the front face uh, who interacts with the project so i think we should conclude on uh, this and we can start off with the next stakeholder tomorrow any questions shaha as yes, of now no questions sir ye aapki taraf se kuch Okay let's call it a day then thank you very much see you tomorrow thank see you thank you very much